Look at your life. What do you see? Are you consumed with struggles? With strife? With pain? Tell me your perspective. Is there a pit you can't see your way out of? Or can you see the beauty of the heavens? Is it today's tears? Or the past provisions? Is it the hardships? Or the things you've overcome? Is it the darkness? Or the God who carries the light to the horizon? So again, what do you see? Well, good morning. I want to welcome each of you to Hill Country Bible Church, those joining us at Steiner Ranch or all of our four venues on the Lakeline campus. And for those joining us online, we're so grateful to be able to be with you today and to do this live. Now, we installed some equipment to make the experience possible. And so it's just exciting that we together are worshiping all at the same time and experiencing the same service. And I can't wait to the day when I get to see everybody face to face again. Looking forward to that. It just seems like in 2020, this is the year of unfinished business. It seems like all the things that we had planned didn't happen, right? And yet... Life is all about unfinished business. Think about it. The gratitude left unexpressed. The opportunity not seized. The premature goodbye to a loved one who passed on into eternity too early. The forgiveness not experienced or granted. All of these things are part of the reality of life. And yet in the midst of that, we've got this incredible promise from God that with God, there is no such thing as unfinished business. Look at the passage that we've been studying together in Romans 8.28. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who've been called according to his purpose. Now, this is profound if you will embrace it and believe it because it's so clear that God is saying that if he's called you into a relationship with himself, that your life has a purpose, you're actually part of God's purpose. And your life is part of his story that he's writing in the world as he brings his salvation to the ends of the earth. So no part of your life is insignificant because we know that in all things, God's taking all the events of your life, working them together for the good of those who love him. So not only for your good, but for his good purpose. Now, this is so important to understand. Your life will be complete, and all of the unfinished business and loose ends are going to get tied up. And you will see that every single aspect of your life has a purpose. Here's the problem. The problem is God is more patient than we are. Like, we want our unfinished business to get finished right now, or let's just be honest, for some of us, when we talk about unfinished business, there's a pit in our stomach because there's stuff in the past that we don't ever want to see again. Like we don't ever want that to come up again. We don't want to have to deal with that again. And if that's what comes to mind when I talk about unfinished business, I want you to understand God knows that. He's with you here right now. And don't get scared and go bolting away or turning off the TV or the computer screen because God has a message about unfinished business. And keep in mind, it says he works these things for the good of those who love him. God's got a loving plan to finish your unfinished business, even if it's ugly. Even if you never want to think about it again. Now, here's the key. 
you may not completely see all this until you come to the end of your life. Because the end of your earthly life is not over until you stand in the very presence of Jesus face to face and he unfolds everything about your life, including how your life will impact future generations that you will never see. So as we work through this kind of concept, you have to understand, we think life is over when we breathe our last breath, but the impact of life and what God is going to do with it, how he's using it, will not be fully understood and revealed until we see Jesus face to face. Now, for those of you who say, I don't have any hope of seeing Jesus face to face, I don't know if I believe Christianity, I don't know if there's something for me in the future. Let me just say, tune in, listen. Because this is an important distinction between those people who think when it's over, it's over, you're dead and gone, which means that your life had no meaning in the first place, which means there's no finished business to finish, didn't actually matter, your existence was a blip on the radar screen, and now that it's over, it's over, and what does it matter? There actually is a better story, and that better story is grounded in facts and reality that you can know. So don't, 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 don't lose me here. Hang in there with me because we're going to take a look at this. Now, here's the principle that we see coming out of this passage, and that is with God, that God will finish the unfinished business of our lives. Keep this in mind. God's going to always finish the unfinished business of our lives. That's what he does. And we know that because as we read the stories of the Bible, we actually see it coming to pass, and we see that in the life of Joseph. So if you grab your Bible and open it to Genesis chapter 41, we're going to start today in verses 50 and 51, and let me bring you up to speed on this person, Joseph. So Joseph is a person in the Old Testament, lived several thousand years ago. The story of Joseph is about a man who experienced all kinds of trauma in his life, which prepared him for a moment when he was standing in front of the most powerful king, in the world at that time, the Pharaoh of Egypt. And there he explained two dreams that the Pharaoh had had. Both of those dreams meant the same thing. And God gave him the interpretation that there would be seven years of all kinds of prosperity, followed by seven years of famine. Joseph immediately at age 30 goes on into an explanation of what Pharaoh needs to do, put somebody in charge to collect the grain during the seven years and store it up in preparation for the bad years, and Pharaoh gives him the job. So for the next seven years, Joseph is spending his life traveling to every major city in the empire, working out a strategy to collect excess grain and store it in a way that it would be available, and he has to store enough for seven years. Now, if you think this is an easy job, just talk to somebody who works for the government. Anybody work for the government? Trying to convince all the politicians and all the lords and ladies in the land who hold power over these cities and over these municipalities that they need to get on board in a time when everybody would go into self-indulgence because look at all that we have to actually be able to change their behavior and store some things up. It feels a little like COVID to me. Kind of feels a little like COVID, right? Like the bad years have come. Are we ready for them? And so that's what Joseph is doing. And during that time, his life takes a major turn. Notice what it says in verse 50. Before the years of famine came, two sons were born to Joseph by Asneth, the daughter of Potiphar, a priest of On. Joseph named his firstborn Manasseh and said, it is because God has made me forget all my trouble and all my father's household. So married to a very prominent family, Joseph has his firstborn son, his firstborn son Manasseh. Manasseh means to forget, to forget. God has caused me to forget. This was a common Hebrew name used of the child that was born after a tragedy as a a name of hope, 
a name of like, it's going to get better. We will remember the tragedy no more. We will remember this child in honor that God is still showing his favor to us. He's taken care of us. So he names him Manasseh. But notice he says, all my trouble and my father's house. In Joseph's mind, his hurt from his past dysfunctional family, his brothers selling him into slavery, his old man showing favoritism, all that is gone. It's dead to him. Joseph has what we would call unfinished business, right? He doesn't want to finish it. He has a second son. Notice what it says in verse 52, the second son named Ephraim. And he said, it is because God has made me fruitful in the land of my suffering. Names him fruitful. So Joseph recognizes that God has been with him, that God has used all of the problems in his life to actually make him fruitful. Now, what's interesting is in the ancient world and in most of history, fruitfulness or having a blessed life is not a life of a consumer. It's a life of a contributor. Now, we in America today, and particularly in suburbia, we believe that the blessed life is the life of a consumer, that I'm getting more, that I'm experiencing more, that I'm having more, that things are going my way, that me and my kids, we get to do more, see more, have more. That, that's the idea of a consumer. That's not the concept of a blessed life. In Scripture, a blessed life is the ability to contribute. And that's why having children was considered the blessing of God, like being able to populate the world with godly kids growing up to make a difference, that having more responsibility, taking on more, doing more ministry, making a bigger impact in the community, being someone that has the ability to be selfless in order to make the world better for others, that's what Joseph's concept of a fruitful life is. Joseph is not living in a palace, eating bonbons, with somebody fanning him while they drop grapes in his mouth. That's us. That's who we are. Joseph was working every day to save people. The second thing that is real important is Joseph gives both of his sons Hebrew names. Now, let me just say a word to parents, okay? Mom and dad, think about this. Do you want your children to blend in or to stand out in the culture? Do you want them to blend in or stand out? You see, here's a Hebrew. He has no business among the lords of the, 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 the Egyptians. They actually hated the people from Cana. Uh, they hated the Canaanites, they hated the Hebrews, they looked down on these people, and yet Joseph is one of them now. You would think that what he would do would be to name his children Egyptian names, but he doesn't do that. Why? Because he wants to honor his God and say that I will honor my God in this land of pagans, and I want my kids to grow up bearing the name of Yahweh, the name of my God. In our culture, we have a tendency to say we want our kids to fit in, to blend in, to not be different, to be the same as everybody else. So they have to have the same opportunities, the same technology, the same schedule, the same things, because if they don't have all the same experiences, they will feel different. The people in the world that make a difference are the ones that are not afraid to be different. The people in the world that blend in are the ones that are just part of the crowd. They just go along to be part of it. Really interesting. Joseph's got unfinished business, but the business that he's taken care of reflects that he believes in God and he wants to honor God and he's living for God in the midst of all of this. So what's Joseph's unfinished business? Well, here's what we see in the Joseph story. And that is often God will fix what's broken in us even if we've given up on it. Even if we've given up on it, he'll fix what's broken in us. Now, it's very important that you understand as we work through this passage that I'm using the word often here. And the reason why I'm using the word often is because everybody's story is different. Your story's not going to work out exactly the same way Joseph's did. And we're going to see two other 
ways that God works with our unfinished business. And so don't simply look at this and go, okay, so I've got some things broken in my past, which means those people are going to come and do right by me. Maybe they will, maybe they won't. But you need to know that in the presence of God, he's going to fix what's broken when you come to the end of your life. But sometimes, and even often, God will do it in this life. If we're looking for it, we're ready for it, and we're living for it, okay? So let's pick up the story. In verse 56, it says, When the famine had spread over the whole country, Joseph opened the storehouses and sold grain to the Egyptians, for the famine was severe throughout Egypt. And all the countries came to Egypt to buy grain from Joseph because the famine was severe in all the world. So like this is... Uh, all the Middle East, and now countries are starting to come. Chapter 42, when Jacob learned, that's Joseph's father, when Jacob learned that there was grain in Egypt, he said to his sons, why do you just keep looking at each other? He continued, I have heard that there is grain in Egypt. Go down there and buy some for us so that we may live and not die. Question. They sold their brother into Egypt. Is that part of the reason why they don't want to go, just has bad memories. Oh, we'll get to them in just a minute. They have some unfinished business too. So the dad sends 10 brothers and keeps one back, Benjamin, the brother of Joseph, who is the only living son of Rachel who died in childbirth giving birth to him. And he ain't going to let his favorite child leave after what happened to his older child, who he assumes was killed by beast. So he sends them down. Watch what happens. Verse 6, now Joseph was the governor of all the land the one who sold grain to all its people. So when Joseph's brothers arrived, they bowed down to him with their faces to the ground. As soon as Joseph saw his brothers, he recognized them, but he pretended to be a stranger and spoke harshly to them. Where do you come from, he asked. From the land of Canaan, they replied to buy food. Although Joseph recognized his brothers, they did not recognize him. Why not? It's been almost 15 years He's full grown, he's dressed like an Egyptian, and he's talking through an interpreter, and who would have ever believed it? They don't even think about it being Joseph. Now watch this in verse 9, then he remembered his dreams about them. Now in this moment, the text is going to imply as we keep reading through it that Joseph is flooded with emotions. He has forgotten about what's happened to him, but not really, because that's the deal with unfinished business. No matter how hard we try to bury it, it just is still there. He tried to forget, but it's still there. And Joseph now is coming face to face with all of his history, his dysfunctional family, his brothers who were jealous of him, who sold him into slavery... Just essentially like, let's get rid of him. They have no idea that he ended up in the house of Potiphar, that there he was sexually harassed and accused of rape, ended up in prison where he was forgotten for years and finally ended up in front of Pharaoh. That's the only reason why he's here. God worked this strange story out in his life to put him in this position, but they're the ones who put him in the pit. They're the ones who tried to take and destroy the life of their own brother, and here they are in front of him, unfinished business. But then he remembers that in his childhood he had a dream. He actually had two dreams, but this is the fulfillment of the first one, that all of his brothers would bow down to him, and they're bowing down. Could God be at work? Could God be at work? Now, what Joseph does next is like really bizarre. So in verse 9, he says, Then he remembered the dreams about them. He said to them, You are spies. You've come to see where our land is unprotected. No, my Lord, they answered. Your servants have come to buy food. We are all sons of one man. Your servants are honest men, not spies. No, he said to them, You've come to see where our land is unprotected. But they replied, Your servants were twelve brothers the son of one man who lives in the land of Cana. So now he knows his dad's alive. The youngest is now with our father, 
Now he knows his brother is alive, and one is no more. They admit that there's one missing. Now, why would they give all this information? That's a really great, great question. Like, the whole story is weird. Because sometimes when God deals with unfinished business, it feels really weird. Like, how's all this coming together? The probable reason is that if you were going to send spies, you wouldn't send them all from the same family. Because if they got caught, that would wipe out an entire family. But beyond that, we don't really know why they give all this information. Verse 14, Joseph said to them, It's just as I told you, you are spies, and this is how you you will be tested. As surely as Pharaoh lives, you will not leave this place unless your youngest brother comes here. Send one of your number to get your brother. The rest of you will be kept in prison so that your words may be tested to see if you are telling the truth. If you are not, then as surely as Pharaoh lives, you are spies. And he put them all in custody for three days. So now they're in jail, and he's saying, you got to bring Benjamin back, or we're not moving forward with this. We're not moving forward with this. So he leaves them in jail for three days, and finally he brings them out of jail after three days and tells them, I'm not going to keep all of you. I'm just going to keep one of you. And as I just keep one of you, then essentially what that's going to do is allow the rest of you to go and then come back. But if you don't bring him back then somebody's going to die. What's happening? The brothers have some unfinished business. Often God will confront us with the sins of our past. Joseph's got to deal with his family and his broken family. The brothers have to deal with what they have done. Now watch what happens next. He goes on, or we pick up in verse 21. Then they said to one another, Surely we are being punished because of our brother. We saw how distressed he was when he pleaded with us for his life, but we would not listen. That is why this distress has come upon us. They remember the day when they sold him into slavery, how he cried, Brothers, I'm your flesh and blood. Don't do this to me. Why are you doing this to me? but they were so calloused. All they could see was their own jealousy and getting rid of the problem was their sin. Now the oldest brother Reuben pipes up in verse 22. He says, Reuben replied, didn't I, did I tell you not to sin against the boy? But you wouldn't listen. Now we must give an accounting for his blood. Here's what Reuben recognized. That sin has consequences. And when we start talking about dealing with the unfinished sin of our past, a lot of times we don't want to think about that because we don't want to deal with the fact that sin has consequences. Now, listen carefully. Jesus made this very clear. In one case, he was talking about how we view or judge other people. And look at what he says in Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 and 2. He says, do not judge or you too will be judged. Do not judge or you too will be judged. Watch, for in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use... It will be measured to you. Now that's profound. Some of you are immediately deleting some of your social media posts right now, right? What Jesus is saying here is that when you do something inappropriate. You do something judgmental. You do something sinful to another human being that God's response is to bring back to you in the same measure what you have done to someone else. Now, let me give you the theology of this because it's real important you understand. God himself is both the life giver and the law giver. 
In other words, God is the one who gives life to each individual on the planet, and he actually never relinquishes control of your life. So every time you use the phrase, my life, about 1% of that's true, and about 99% of that is false. Because your life actually belongs to God. God created you, gave you breath, gave you your abilities, gave you your intellect. He actually shapes time, gave you your opportunities, the places where you would be born, the person that you'd be born. Like God's done all of those things that are totally outside of your control. And in the end, God's going to take your life back either into his presence and into his glory or into eternal separation. That's what God, God owns your life. He's the life giver. He's also the law giver. And by law giver, what God says is, I am the one, God is the one who defines how we treat each other. So every time I do something to break God's law toward you, I've done two gravest evils. Number one, I said to the lawgiver, your law does not apply to me and I can do what I want to do. Whoa. Whoa. And when I do what I want to do, it's going to hurt me and it's going to hurt them. Because that's God's law is always good to protect life, to protect personhood, to help us live in a way that creates a good and just and noble society. Selfishness and pride are the opposite of that. They damage society. So I violated, I've sinned against the lawgiver, but when I've done it to you, another human being, I've actually sinned against the life giver. Because God cares about the person that I just hurt. So that's why so many times you see in Scripture, when somebody sins against another person, they'll say, but it's against you that I sin, God. And you say, well, no, you sinned against them. But as God is their father, their creator, the one that gave them life, who honors that life, when you sin against another person, You've actually sinned against God. So who's going to be the remedy? Who's going to make it up? Who's going to deal with the problem? It's not just the other person who experienced the sin. In fact, that's why God says, don't take revenge, people. I got this. When someone hurts you, slanders you, treats you badly, and you feel like I've got to retaliate, you don't. Because your life giver and your law giver says, I've got this. As my parents used to tell me when I was a kid and my brother would hit me and I would hit him back. The phrase I hated so much. Two wrongs don't make a right. Sure seemed like it. (laughs) But you know what I was not doing? I was not taking into account my parents as the Life givers in miniature and the law givers in our house to deal with my brother's evil? I was taking matters into my own hands. And that's why we escalate conflict because they did it to me, so I get to do it back to them. No, God is the one who deals with sin. And God is going to deal with these brothers. This is their unfinished business. And Joseph is in this weird, weird place. I want you to see what it says. So Reuben takes responsibility for what has happened. He says, we're guilty of of our brother's blood. And we read in verse 24, he, Joseph, oh no, verse 23, uh, they did not realize that Joseph could understand them since he was using an interpreter. So they're all talking Hebrew about what they did to their brother. They have no idea that this guy can, is listening. He can understand Hebrew because he's been speaking through an, an Egyptian interpreter. He turned away from them and began to weep. 
Like Joseph can't even take it anymore. He's witnessing the confession of his brothers, which was not intended for him to hear. Because God is taking care of Joseph's unfinished business of his broken past while he's beginning to bring the brothers to a place of repentance. Now, how Joseph treats all of this, we don't understand. So is Joseph trying to get revenge by calling them spies, by putting one of them in jail? Simeon's going to get put in jail. Is, is Joseph testing them to find out if their repentance is really true? Is, is Joseph orchestrating all of this so that he can get his brother, Benjamin, back and see his father? Is he doing all that? The text doesn't tell us. It just leaves us in the dark. We really don't know what Joseph is thinking and feeling. We don't know what he's trying to do. But here's what we do know. The circumstances of what takes place here for the brothers. Now, this is important. I wish I had time to explain it all. There are 10 specific things that happen with the brothers here that remind them of what they did to Joseph. 10 specific things. If you want to know what those are, email me and I'll send them to you. Okay, 10 specific things. So the brothers leave and Joseph sends them away. Simeon is in jail. So nine of them are traveling back and he does this one other weird thing. He puts the money that they paid for the grain in their sacks. And at night, one of them opens their sack and realizes, oh, the money that we paid is in the sack. He's been accusing us of being spies. And the second half of verse 28, he said, their hearts sank and they turned to each other trembling and said, what is this that God has done to us? They are now well aware that something weird is going on and God must be at work. But he's not just orking them because there's one more player in this story, and that's Jacob. Often God will heal the wounds of our faithlessness. Now we're talking about Daddy Jacob. They get back. They unpack all of this. They tell their father why they've come home again with one less brother. They tell their father that Simeon will not be released and they will not be able to trade in the land and they will be under a death sentence by the Pharaoh of Egypt if they don't bring Benjamin back. And then watch what happens. Verse 35, as they were emptying their sacks, there in each man's sack was his pouch of silver. When they and their father saw the money pouches, they were frightened. Their father Jacob said to them, now listen, listen carefully to what he says. You have deprived me of my sons. Joseph is no more and Simeon is no more. He's pointing the finger at his sons, but he's saying to them, this is your fault. What's he thinking? Is it possible that what he's thinking is, I sent Joseph those 15 years ago now, 20 years ago now, sorry, um, 20 years ago now, I sent him... And you came back without him and with money. Now I send you guys and you come back without Simeon, but with money. What are you doing? Are you selling your brothers? Like what's going on here? But you have, um, you've deprived me. You're the ones who've stolen my children from me. And he brings that down on their head. Why? They've got unfinished business, right? They got to deal with but he does too. Watch what he says next. You've deprived me of my children. Joseph is no more and Simeon is no more. And now you want to take Benjamin. And then he says this statement, everything is against me. Everything is against me. Now, Reuben's going to say, hey, let us take Benjamin and you can kill my two sons. Like, if we don't bring him back, man, this like, It seems like it's going south really fast, right? And he says, no, I'm not sending Benjamin under any circumstances. Now, we'll find out next week what happens, but I want us to finish on that statement. Everything is against me. Jacob, the heel grabber, 
who his whole life he spent deceiving people to get what he wanted, has had two major face-to-face encounters with God himself. Anybody here would just like to have one? Just one? Two major encounters. In the first one at Bethel, when he was running from his brother, God appeared to him and inspired the song, Stairway to Heaven. Right? He saw a stairway with angels ascending and descending. You know? Put modern music on the map. The second time, he was coming to see his brother, and God appeared again at camp, at at the place where he wrestled with God all night. He's had two direct encounters with God. Here's what God said to him in the first encounter. I want you to see what God said to him. I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go. Watch this promise. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Now, the in-between, the dot, 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 is I'm going to raise up your descendants. I'm going to give you a land. It's going to be more than the sands of the seashore. In other words, the promise that he made to Abraham, he remakes it again to Jacob. And yet Jacob is at the end of his life looking around and saying, everything is against me. You ever say that? You ever say that? Lost my job. Everything is against me. Got COVID. Everything is against me. Think about that. We started with Romans 8.28. We know that God works all things together for the good of those who love him. Paul writes in Philippians chapter 1 verse 6, and we know that he who began a good work in you We'll complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. And many of us would say we believe the Bible. We believe that God is true, that God never tells a lie. And yet, how easy it is for us to lose faith. Jacob has seen God face to face twice with promises both times. I will work out my plan. You're going to see the glory of my plan lived out in you. Friends, that's God's promise to us as well. Faithlessness in the person and work of Jesus on the cross is always displayed in the way we crumble when things do not appear to be going well. We always will grieve the hurt, but to give up on the story of our lives. Now that's faithlessness. And here's what's so cool. Before the story's all over, God will have kept his promises. Family's going to be reconciled. They're going to get saved. Dad is going to be reunited with his son. But what God is doing in the world is saving the Egyptians too. Saving the Canaanites too. Like he's moving to make a difference in the greater world. And my question always is to myself and to you also, is that good enough? Or does it always have to be about make my life comfortable and joyful and wonderful now? Because the greatest transformations come when we walk through the darkest moments and see God working it all together for good to those who love him, who've been called according to his purpose. Michelangelo, the great sculptor, sculpted a whole lot. But if you travel to Italy, you'll see that there are four specific statues that are still frozen in that block of granite. 
When you see these unfinished statues, you see parts of a person trying to emerge. There's an arm, there's a torso, part of the head trying to emerge, but they're stuck in the granite. I mean, in the, in the marble, they, they, they're not fully themselves. They, they're not fully who they could be because so much of them is frozen and unrevealed. Pondering this, author Theodore Rooker looked at these four figures that Michelangelo Angelo called the captives and wrote, when I look at those partial figures, they stir up in me deep longing to be completed an ache to be set free from that which distorts and disfigures, imprisons and inhibits my humanness, my wholeness. Do you ever feel that way? I want to be free from the fear and anxiety and the striving and the, the, the desires and the, the, the inability to, to be who God's called me to be. I want to be free from that. But as with those statues, he writes, I cannot liberate myself. For that, I need the hand of another. Somebody else has got to chisel away the rest. Will you have the courage today to say to God, the master sculptor, finish my life the way you want to finish it, And I'm going to see your glory as you do. May the unfinished business of your life result in amazing and unbelievable impact that someday you'll celebrate in the presence of Jesus a life well lived, well done, good and faithful servant. Let us pray. Father in heaven, My prayer is that you'd open our eyes to who you are. That on that day that you rolled away the stone and quickened the lifeless body of Jesus and raised him from the dead, that that is the day that you declared that you can do all things and that you have a purpose for us. May we embrace that with faith. May we let the unfinished business of our lives be finished in your good time, knowing that we have hope. And our hope will not disappoint because your spirit has poured out your love in our hearts. Father, move us deeply, deeply, deeply into your love and your purpose. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.